Um, everybody, it's an incredible honor and pleasure to hear from Jennifer, who is a legend. I am going to let her introduce herself in this Living History talk. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be chatting today about um, a little bit about myself and um, how I've uh, got in into this scientific world, um, not only of physics, but chemistry as well as biology. Um, so uh, unlike, unlike Banu, I, I grew up in the United States. Um, my father was a chemistry professor at the University of Maryland. Um, so I grew up very much sort of steeped in a scientific um, environment. In fact, we had a periodic table hanging in our kitchen and we'd practice memorizing the different elements as kids. So, you know, it was sort of in my blood early on. Um, and we also lived on a farm, so I liked being outside. And so that probably ultimately directed me into the biology world as opposed to chemistry or direct physics. Um, but uh, there was a little segue in this whole process because um, I went to a Quaker school called Swarthmore College. It's a it's a very um, uh, sort of uh, steeped in liberal arts college. You know, one of the first first co-ed colleges in the United States. So very much um, you know supporting women as well as women's education as well as men's. Um, but anyway, at Swarthmore, um, I started of course doing science, but very quickly got enamored with philosophy, psychology. In fact, those were the two topics that I majored in. And the, the philosophy, um, I was really fascinated with just how one acquires the, the nature of knowledge. You know, what is knowledge? Um, you know, reading, you know, Greek philosophers, modern philosophers really um, made me keenly aware of the different types of questions that we have as human as humans in, try and, in, in terms of interrogating the world. Um, and uh, basically that's kept with me throughout my uh, scientific career because it's it's made me keenly aware of what it is when we're asking questions, what do we mean? And I'll just sort of as a prelude uh, mention that one particular philosopher that sort of stood out, a pre-Socratic philosopher uh, was Heraclitus who, um, Basically, one of the famous quotes from him is that no man um, ever steps in the same river uh, twice. Uh, and basically what that means is that um, the world is in constant flux. And if we're going to understand the world, we need to understand the nature of that flux. And that stood in direct con you know, contrast to the philosophers that thought the world as structural, basically atomistic knowledge. Um, so basically those two worlds sort of is what I faced when I started doing science. But before I sort of got into science, um, I uh, spent some time, I mean, basically having finished, uh, uh, I'm going to just share my screen here um, very quickly. Um, let's see, is there a way to share, share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. Let me double check. Yes, you should be able to. It says one participant can share at a time. Um, so somebody else must be sharing. Um, um, okay, got it. Okay. okay, I think I'm good. Okay, perfect. Um, can you? Okay, great. So uh, basically, this is... Um, because when I finished college, I really felt I didn't understand the world. I didn't know anything about the world. Um, I spent a year I, teaching. Can you see sorry. me? I can see you, but I can't see your screen. Oh, okay. Here we go. Let's, okay, sure. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So basically I spent a year in Africa, um, in Kenya as a high school teacher, uh, right after college. Um, Basically, I felt that I needed to learn about the world before I was going to make any decisions as to what I wanted to do long term. And it was really in Kenya because I was teaching science um, that I realized that's where I want to spend my career. 
um, basically, I need to learn more science. I need to, um, because science is uh, really what is going to help help us in the world. And uh, this is just me. This picture here is me with one of the other teachers in the school uh, where we were discussing, you know, the plans for the next day in the classroom. The classrooms were dirt floors. The students, we had no textbooks. Um, as you see, this little desk here, I built myself because uh, there were no desks or anything in the in the in the little um, buildings that we were uh, living in. But anyway, it was a very formative experience for me because it it made me determined um, to learn more science. And uh, basically, I came back to the United States and uh, entered uh, graduate school. Uh, first, I was at Stanford. Um, to do a master's because I really needed to um, sort of get a hard background in biology. And then I moved to Johns Hopkins to do PhD work. And very quickly, sort of taking the lead from this sort of philosophical tradition of Heraclitus, where you need to see things, you need to see things move. Um, I very much quickly became interested in viewing things under a microscope. And uh, this is me. At a, as a postdoc um, at NIH, I was working with Richard Klausner, um, looking at uh, cells. Uh, now, the cells that we were looking at are fixed cells. Um, this is an EM of a of a eukaryotic cell, um, but basically everything was fixed, and that was frustrating because um, basically. Uh, you know, you can't see dynamism in a fixed cell. You had to infer it in some in some fashion, and uh, basically because we really didn't have um, really good technology for doing things live, other than adding antibodies and watching how the antibodies might be taken up into these cells, um, the the field was really focused on um, three types of technologies in the cell biology world, immunocytic chemistry, where you could come in with antibodies, biochemistry, as well as genetics. And uh, that was the world that I lived in as a graduate student postdoc. And uh, that changed dramatically with the advent of this little protein here called green fluorescent protein. Um, and very quickly, I realized that the GFP could be really the, the key for allowing us to begin to look at things dynamically within a cell. Um, and uh, basically a graduate student of mine was able to get a hold of the, um, the clone from uh, uh, Chalfi, uh, and we quickly put it onto some proteins that we expressed within the cell. And we started being able to do some amazing things. And so one of the first structures that we looked at is the Golgi apparatus. Um, you can see, uh, we've expressed a, a green fluorescent protein attached to a Golgi enzyme. We see this beautiful Golgi structure. And uh, one of the things that we very quickly realized is that if we photo bleached part of that organelle, um, we saw molecules very quickly refilling in the area that we had photo bleached. This was extremely exciting for, for me at least because up to that time, most people had felt that these enzymes that populate this organelle were static. Basically, they were anchored to various places in this organelle doing their job of modifying carbohydrates as protein moved through, through this system. But this showed right off, I mean, basically immediately that things were much more robust. These enzymes were diffusing within this organelle uh, and everything was in motion just as Heraclitus uh, basically was saying, you know, as a pre-Socratic. Um, and uh, basically we needed to try to understand this. And this is when I began to felt, fall, fall in love with physics and physical chemistry, because um, basically uh, we could start looking at all kinds of processes in this cell, uh, in these cells. Uh, these are ER to Golgi transport intermediates that you can see are moving. Uh, we can show that they're moving on curvilinear tracks uh, towards the Golgi apparatus, um, and uh, you know, measuring that motion again required quantitative tools, uh, different ways to think about uh, this dynamism. 
Um, and this is just another example of a photo bleaching experiment uh, where we could photo bleach a portion of a GFP molecule within the ER. You can see fast recovery, um, but by measuring the diffusion coefficient of that recovery process, we could compare different um, GFP that's put in different compartments within the cell uh, with, the, with the way that these molecules move freely in the cytoplasm or in water. And that gave us some very interesting insights into the different physical environments of these different places within the cell. Uh, again, these were questions that were extremely exciting to me because to me, understanding the cell meant understanding its dynamism, understanding its flux. And we need this kind of information is critical for um, sort of getting a holistic picture of that type of flux. Um, uh, we could also do con uh, continuous photo bleaching and show that we can empty all fluorescence out of compartments like the endoplasmic reticulum, meaning that this organelle, this compartment is completely interconnected with itself. There's no subdomains that don't intercommunicate. Again, extremely important information about the fundamental features, the fundamental physics of these, uh, this particular organelle. Now, one of the things that we um, were interested in was how uh, cargo can move through the secretory pathway. And this is just a, a movie showing um, release of cargo from the first part of that uh, secretory pathway, the ER, uh, and following cargo moving into the Golgi and then to the cell surface. Um, that was extremely exciting because for the first time we could start measuring rate constants for how the cargo is moving between the different, the consecutive compartments of the secretory pathway, the ER, the Golgi, the plasma membrane, and then ultimately degradation in the lysosome. And uh, by quantifying all of this, we could we could get rate constants. Again, uh -huh. sort of bringing in sort of physics uh, to get insights into properties of these uh, structures. Jennifer, now, I'm really sorry, you're near the end of your time. Okay, cool. So I just want to end by saying that um, basically we, oh, this is a lot of stuff that here, um, we, from this basically through collaborations with many, many people, and I want to um, sort of echo what Manu was saying, that uh, basically collaboration is the name of the game uh, in science. Uh, you come up with good ideas, you, you embrace new technologies, and you run with those technologies um, by integrating with uh, people who have shared interests uh, in those technologies and the questions that underlie them. So basically, um, this is just sort of a sum up of all of the sort of imaging technologies that I've met with over the course of my career. Um, each one of these involved incredible collaborations with people that had expertise that allowed us to really uh, move in these different directions. And, and so for those of you who are listening, uh, what I want, would like to encourage is when you do your science, um, do it in a way where you can embrace new technology, but at the same time, uh, uh, understand the significance of uh, close collaborations with people who can really help uh, uh, move the science forward. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the audience, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, we've had a few questions come in. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll ask you one burning question from yeah. Alpana Mandal, which is what informed your decision to go to Kenya in the first place? Oh, so um, <laughs> good. So uh, basically, at, there was a professor at our school who had a contact there. Um, and I had, you know, I I had heard about uh, what they were doing, uh, and that there and that there were people who were needed as science teachers in this community. So, um, you know, I was wrote a letter to the headmaster of the of the school, asking, you know, whether you know I could come to do some to teach, and uh, the response was yes. And so we ended up being, uh, I ended up being able to be paid by uh, the East African mission uh, you, uh um it's a it's a quaker mission group that was that paid us uh paid me uh 
and my boyfriend at the time uh, who accompanied me. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, uh, in the interest of time, I'm closing the recording and moving the